So I'm Jennifer Hassler, and I'm going to give you a historical perspective on sort of floating gate circuits as we sort of see them going in towards neuromorphic engineering. I'm going to touch on a number of different topics over this, over this time frame. So hopefully this will be interesting. So you might imagine a person is sort of coming along and has been looking at a lot of neuromorphic fields, kind of comes along and really wants to ask a question. You know, I got a question about non-volatile memories. Like, sure. Um, and again, this is like, well, what about these floating gate devices, you know, and particularly being used for synapses? Do you know anything about this? Like, you know, I might say, yeah, maybe I do know something about the subject. And then you might get a question like this. You know, I hear that some researchers thinking floating gates might eventually be a useful substitute for memristors and RRAMs and related devices for neuromorphic, as those are really core things for neuromorphic design. And, well, hmm. So, do you have any thoughts? Uh, okay. There's more to this story. So, how much time do you have? About 15 minutes. So, the first thing is, what do we mean by floating gate devices or circuits? And at one level, it's basically looking at capacitive circuits, like you might imagine, uh, for the capacitive voltage divider or capacitors around an, an amplifier, if assuming it's an ideal amplifier. And it turns out what's nice is I get this additional charge term in this. And it's really amazing that I don't just have just the passive element, but I've also got this other element. Now, that can either be a negative if I don't know what to do with the charge or a positive if I do. But it's amazing because on chip, we get capacitors as our natural elements. When I'm looking at taking this element and figuring the charge, the question is how do I program it? And this is actually really incredible because I can take an IV curve and just move it around. This is really neat. And so by basically changing that charge, like I might end up using by taking hot electron injection by putting electrons on it, or taking electron tunneling by taking electrons off of this PFET device, I could move this around. This is really cool. And you're thinking, okay, this could be a really interesting device. And this became really important because when you start to go back to, like, say, the late 1980s and early 1990s, when they had the early neural network excitement, there were certain things that were understood by this point. One is that you wanted to implement things in mesh architectures. And that turned out to give you sort of the optimal way to build synapses. We also knew that synapses took most of the complexity and that, you know, there are multiple neural network and synapse designs. But the issue was always an analog memory and how do you approach that? And it turns out that it basically either meant you had a DAC or, or a refreshable structure or a number of things were really difficult. Now, as people had talked about things like floating gate elements, again, the, they're the core elements of EEPROM and double EEPROM and flash. You see this started in 1967 and 1970 um, and various individuals there um, and tried to start building companies out of this. Now, what you start to look at is that there were early attempts to do floating gate elements that were had an analog nature, both people like Martin Brook, uh, Intel took their uh, one attempt at this. You even saw some early work out of Caltech that kind of went into synaptics. And you go, wait, synaptics, didn't they, don't they make touch pads? Like, well, they do now. They, did, they started off by wanting to make synapses, which is therefore the name. And that gets us to an interesting time frame, say, you know, over, over dinner in Pasadena in like 1993. And Carver Mead just had three of his, you know, PhD students hanging out with him. And basically made this comment, like, you know, I think you could make an adaptive synapse with just a single transistor. Some thought ensued. You know, one sort of looked like, wait, I wonder if it has to do with like transistors and slide rules. And this turned out to be a, an incredibly fruitful set of research uh, that Brad Minch did and really pioneered and worked through that. But also you kind of look and go, well, maybe there is a chance, you know, but we need some changes to make this work. The kind of sort of the ideas. And that eventually led to the single transistor learning synapse concept which basically started off by taking a transistor, put a ba base implant to kick up the threshold voltage to about six volts, and therefore you could make things work. And why? Well, because it became the first device that you could actually show injection and sub-threshold, and therefore the signal current and the adaptation were all really well related. And this became important because there was five key requirements towards any sort of synapse you'd want to build, both in terms of being able to store it in a non-volatile way, doing the feed-forward computation, being able to do the adaptation and programming, but also be really small and also low power, which meant the sub-threshold aspect. And all of those are essential. And that turned out to give us, you know, a whole number of different publications across this whole group, and it, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a wonderful time. 
And it wasn't just a single device, but you could put this into an array and you could see that you could actually measure a single device, but also inject precisely with no disturbs across the array on the injection, where the tunneling was okay, but only sort of okay, um, even given how strong and exponential it was. So we looked at this initial device and thought, this is great, everything is in good shape. And let's just make a smaller one because that's a good idea. And then we go, nope. It turned out it was much worse behavior because this interesting implant structure didn't behave well when you went, you know, lower threshold voltage, all the spacer layers to get rid of the high fields, not such a good thing. And you're like, oh, I really want a robust injection device. And maybe I could do PFET injection. This is something people started looking at around this time frame. And then, you know, there was these discussions around the bench. It's like, you know, this sort of instrumentation structure just kept giving strange errors and just something could just kept seeing again and again. When you look at the structure, you're like, after I go, oh, wait, there's an injecting PFET. Hi, injecting PFET. And it's exactly in the configuration you'd want to use to get this to control. And it turns out that PFET's injected pretty much in every process from 2 micron to pretty much 40 nanometer and, and beyond at this point. And so it's been incredibly robust. But on top of it, that configuration allowed us to build what we called an auto zeroing floating gate amplifier, which basically was a floating gate version of a high pass filter, but it allowed us to talk about adaptation and then further signal dependent adaptation, which becomes incredibly important for doing learning systems. So this is great. And so, we're, you know, we have every kind of a cool party, you know, at this point over a couple years. And then Carver says, oh, by the way, I'm retiring. And so then everybody leaves. Um, and then, you know, eventually Chris looks at this and goes, wait, there's commercial things to be done here. Creates a company. Um, and we go from there. Well, go a couple years later at Georgia Tech. There's now sort of, you know, further elements in terms of trying to program it and how do we make this work. And what we find out is that we have, you know, boards now that can automate the floating gate programming. Again, floating gates have become pretty stable and standard and sort of sort of core structures. But the core thing here was to be able to do programming such that I could have any heterogeneous infrastructure stru or a structure and then switch it back into a crossbar array that I could always program. This turned out to be really cool, and this was really the first of core steps. Maybe different from what we might have now today in the blue with all the infrastructures, but this step was critical because it was far better than having a bench of equipment. So we have these boards, and like, okay, so the question came back, well, how many you build? Maybe three or four? Twenty. No, no, re really. Here, let me take, let me show you something. Um, group, oh wait, more group, more group, oh wait, I get your point. We're going to need a lot of this. And it turned out lots of different things happened out of this in terms of getting good references, which included even building a whole bunch of DACs and EDCs. It was amazing all the analog structures you could build out of this. We could actually build floating gate amplifiers. You could build sensor, ampli um, sensor interfaces, particularly capacitive sensors, filters, trans transconductance amplifiers. It was pretty incredible what was possible here. Now you have to understand that this really changed the way you do analog design because just taking a look at transconductance design, which we really love using because it has sort of the highest bandwidth per given energy and the lowest noise for given bias current, but it really needs programmability. You need to have high linearities in some ways in certain places and you need a way to compensate for the offsets. Well, it turns out you can actually program the bias currents of those differential pairs now and really precisely as well as I can then tune the various offsets in a precise way and program the linear range to precisely what I need and no more for a particular application. Oh, this really changes it and it sort of makes analog elements programmable in a really amazing way. So then we could then go on further and talk about vector matrix multiplication um, and then continue and that kind of builds into this early concept of computing and memory which was sort of a, initially discussed about two decades ago now and then how you start to build this into acoustic signal processing and a whole range of things. Further, you can talk about CMOS imaging, building a straight in imagers, and then doing transforms like discrete Fourier transforms right on the image plane and other kind of structures. Eventually talking about doing learning systems, so really early continuous time classifiers um, and learning and LMS structures, incredible stuff. And then of course it does end up allowing you to build neurons and synapses, particularly when you have channel models of the neurons to talk about what kind of synapses and other elements and then build sort of larger arrays, including going into arrays of dendrites and classifiers and so forth. Incredible structures. Well, at some point, a bunch of my students looked at this and said, hey, this would be great. 
uh, I think we want to make a company and we're getting close to graduating. So let's call this company Geotronics and um, went out to California, which is really looking at floating Kate devices for acoustics. Well, this company then was eventually bought by TI in 2010 and continued to have impact. So then we start talking about floating gate devices being used for large-scale field programmable analog arrays, or FPAs. I'm sure some people are going, I couldn't imagine this showing up in a conversation, but yeah, it does. So when we talk about floating gate elements, what we're really talking about is a mixed signal equivalent of FPGAs, where you have analog developments, logic, and routing all in one structure. Um, really kind of started by, you know, by a couple of different students um, who were originally involved with creating the first FPGA course at Georgia Tech, and then this sort of became part of their, their graduate research. And what was amazing is after about 20 years of innovation, there's been a huge amount of learning and opportunity on this, um, really where a lot of concepts and blocks and structures have all kind of solidified for this. It's pretty been, been pretty amazing, but the programmability was essential to any of this happening. And it turns out that FPAs are more than FPGAs because although FPGAs may be, you know, sort of fabric and lot, there's usually a lot of specialization where in, the, where in the analog structure you actually get the computation right in the routing. And this is really kind of incredible, but it was entirely due to the programmability at a switch level and that I can program elements outside, outside the power supply range. So this is really computing in memory and computing by switches, and the switches just are not dead weight in this case. It opened up a whole bunch more things, particularly machine learning, but in a whole bunch of elements that are listed. And there's a whole bunch more, actually. And they're tools. And that would be a whole other topic. And it's an amazing sort of thing that you can actually sit down and have students use this. So, like, given all this history, how did memristors and not floating gates become commonly associated with neuromorphic engineering? It seems like a fair question. Well, in the mid 2000s, you had a lot of interesting interest in government sort of spaces here, and DARPA being one of them, and they'd had a bunch of different programs, CTWS, Neurovision, so forth. And then you ended up attracting, you know, neuro uh, nano device people like Todd Hilton, who was like, hey, I got members of stuff, um, coming to DARPA and going, hey, I think we could actually do some neural stuff. Let's call that Synapse. Well, what was interesting is that you can see a number of key things in the Synapse program, but the key to look at you going, wait, don't they just want a floating gate single transistor learning synapse? I'm like, yep, exactly. Um, so you can see sort of thing as sort of a scale in terms of the process all the way through. The key thing is that the power was supposed to be less than one kilowatt, and you're like, uh, that's way high, but that had all to do with the low nano resistance on conductivities, um, or the, the high con the high the low resistance. And so that's kind of what you're dealing with there. So the program starts and you have a bunch of people, and oh yeah, there's a floating gate backup plan. Um, it's like, hey, by the way, this works. Um, but yeah, phase one starts, and they end up saying, okay, you device people can leave now. What? Okay. It got a lot smaller. Uh, and we got to there, and the floating is like, hey, the phase one metric works, and we're good on phase two, and I think we can get to phase three. Uh, there's some crossbars working on the other devices. Um, that really foundational work, University of Michigan. Started phase two. is like, yep, we don't need the floating gates. Goodbye. Um, and by the end of the program, it was basically IBM's True North, and you're like, hey, that's a really good chip, but isn't it entirely digital? Yeah. There became another DARPA program, which is a whole other attempt, and you go, yeah, nicer chip, isn't that all digital? Something's disconnected here. So we kind of had this conversation, and it makes sense, and then, you know, the person comes wandering by and goes, hey, did you find out if floating gates are like, you know, a good short-term fix for all the memristor stuff, because that's what we want to do for neuromorphic things? And the person says, yeah, I think we have our answer. I'll need to explain this to you, as you can now explain to others. And uh, move along. And, oh, yeah, we try to make this all work. And I look forward to hearing your, your questions and your comments. No, really, I do. And thank you for watching so very much.